one. Welcome to A Professor's Life, your weekly webcast for all things academia. That's right, I said weekly, folks. We are switching from fortnightly to weekly. And uh, with me tonight is Robert. Uh, yeah, yeah. And Stephen. I'm glad that we're changing this way because I didn't. that means I don't have to learn what fortnightly means. Yeah, you don't have to look up the big words. Mm-hmm. And also, by the way, I'm Chris. So uh, I forgot to introduce myself. And it's Christmas in July. It's, <laughs> so... Um, this week, what we thought we would talk about is interviewing, interviewing for a job in particular, not interviewing for like, a, well, I don't know what else you'd interview for, but other than a job. So, uh, <laughs> well, the, we know. can interview somebody on this yeah. show, for example. So, uh, okay, so there's many, there's many, uh, there's many meanings to the word interview. No, wait, there's only one meaning. Okay, so uh, <laughs> why are you our host? <laughs> I don't know. Why am I this? Because I'm the one that volunteered. Uh, like everything else in academia. Like right. I can't look at academia. I came up with the idea. Therefore, I'm the host. Right. That's go. how. Your first office. That's yes. right. Punishment. That's, hey, I came up with the idea. Guess what? I chaired the committee. Yep. That's how it works. So um, anyway, we are all joking aside. We are talking about interviewing today. We thought we'd share our interviewing experiences, the various jobs we've interviewed for. And maybe if we'd be so bold. Uh, give some interviewing advice to those that are thinking about uh, finding a job in academia. Uh, I think my first advice is go away. Don't do it. No, just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Our go, stay out. go to industry. You make more money. Oh, all right. All joking aside, folks. Um, that is true. In industry, you will make more money. Yeah, yeah well, that's yeah. true. That is true, likely. Unless you work for a really bad industry. Anyway, um, so... Let's uh, go ahead and talk a little bit about interviewing experiences. And uh, Stephen, why don't I put you on the spot first this week? Oh, I'm putting that on the spot. Okay. Um, Yeah. Interviewing. Well, there's a lot to it. Uh, The process would... There's something really interesting about the fact that I don't think people are ever prepared for this. They get freaked out about it. They get concerned. They preoccupy with things like worrying about their job talk and things like that. But they don't actually prepare themselves for on site or even meeting with people. And what I mean by that is little things. Like maybe you should learn who you're going to be meeting with, who the interviewees are, uh, interviewers yeah, right. are. Um, <laughs> apparently, one of the best feedback I got on on job talks or, or in, in campus visits in the past was, wow, he seemed to actually know something about all the different people in our department. It's like, well, that seems like the minimum amount that you should do, but apparently that I'm on the outside on that. And it's something notable. I mean, that's a job. Well, yeah. Um, But that's a notable piece. It's so little effort for you to learn something about people in in the department that you might want to work in that you should do this. And this is interviewing anywhere. I mean, this is interviewing an industry, let alone in, in academia. But in academia, you've got some people who have decent egos, have a lot of a self obsession, and there's a lot of information about them. You may not have all that. They may be decent egos and self-obsession in industry, uh, but you can't find out a ton about them. Uh, here you find out everything, all that they've done, all their current research, uh, working papers, where they presented, the books they've done. Um, some people talk about their, you know, on their CV, they have their children, their hobbies, apparently everything that they like to do. I, one person that applied for a job actually said his hobby was listening to music, which I thought was an interesting hobby. Um, I, <laughs> didn't know it was a hobby. That's something I enjoy, but not hobby. But you really need to do your homework. Just number one, what the place is that you're going to be talking to, who they are, what they do, what's interesting about them. Um, you do that, it opens up a lot of doors. Uh, I have hours of stuff I could talk about, but I was going to leave that, and then we're going to flip around, I think, from person to person. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, Robert, um, either experience, advice, but let's talk about interviewing. Okay, uh... Number one bit of advice, almost every single listing has a contact person in it. Call the person. Get a hold of them. Find out what the job's actually about. Uh, You'd be amazed. Uh, I did this my second go on the market. My first go on the market, I didn't do this and ran into some weird situations, like having to redo my entire job talk the night before uh, because I went out to dinner with the committee and kind of told them what I thought it was going to do, and they said, no, we don't want to hear about any of that. And I was like, okay, so I stayed up all night and redid my talk. Um, this time around, I started calling people, you know, find out what are they interested in, what's the job, you know, what are the people like there, 
Um, and it, it did me in good stead. Uh, almost every single place I called where I actually got to talk to the person I got a side interview. So I, I think it made a big difference because it moves you to have a lot. They remember you. They'll actually look at your CV or maybe give it a second look if they discounted it the first time. Um, being well, on the and, other and end, you of can this, clarify things too, right? Yeah. I mean, you can. You said, "Oh, well, you're looking for that. It wasn't on my CV, but." Yes. Yeah, and uh, I've done it the other way around uh, for jobs I've posted and other departmental jobs. People calling me, and you just talk to these people, uh, and sometimes you go, well, "Hell no, I'm never going to write this person out. They're ass." Uh, but other times you went, you know, I didn't give them, I think, as, as good a read on their CV as I could have. Or you interpret things differently because they can put some things in context. I mean, these these are dead documents. You know, our curriculum vitas don't tell you very much about the person. Right. It just tells you if they're above the bar or in certain criteria. Uh, when I was prepping for this, uh, there was an article out there about law firms and how most of the best law firms now don't look at GPA or standing anymore uh, because they've found out that these metrics don't mean squat. So a lot of the stuff that we've put a lot of uh, time and effort into doesn't mean anything anymore. People now want to know mainly, can you pass the travel test? Mm -hmm. Is the person going to be a good colleague or is it going to be another ass you have to deal with? Mm -hmm. uh, so that would be the, the thing that jumped out at me uh, the most, you know, over, you know, what, 15 years in academia. Um, call the damn person. You know, just make the call. And I don't think most new people would. No, no. Especially if you are if you're not haven't defended yet. So you're you know you're going to defend coming up. You're looking for that job. You're you're really green. You don't know what's going on. You may or may not have an advisor who is sort of willing to talk to you about the interview process. So. It's gonna be scary, you know. It's, do I look like I'm being too forward by contacting these people? You know, uh, how do I do it? You know, and just a quick email. I mean, even if it's not phone, if it's an email, whatever. You know, uh, I think it's appropriate. I would. Uh, one of my pieces of advice is sort of similar to what Stephen had said. Get to know the institution that you are applying to. So, you know, yeah, we have to do somewhat of the shotgun effect where you're putting out a bunch of applications. That's just part of this job, right? You have to put out, but. When you get called for that phone interview, know something about them. When you go there, you know, for example, if you're teaching uh, or applying for a small, maybe like a liberal arts college, you need to be prepared for the fact that uh, you will have people outside of your field on your hiring committee. Mm -hmm. It's a small, it's a small school. You may have like a department of three that you're trying to get into and you would be the third. Hmm. And so, you know, for example, when I interviewed, I had a creative writer on my committee. And he asked me straight, I mean, this was my second um, job, so I was experienced in interviewing at this point, but he asked me a point blank question. He was, why do you think you have a creative writer on your uh, committee? And if I were, you know, Chris, grad school Chris looking for that first tenure track job, I would have definitely screwed that answer up. Not that there was necessarily a right or wrong answer to that, but he was sort of feeling me out, you know, what do you, what do you think? And so you have to be prepared for, if you're in this kind of environment, you have to be prepared for, one, having people who know nothing about your field on your committee or very little about your field on your committee. And two, when you give that job talk, if you make the effort to make that talk accessible to uh, those folks who are not in your field but on your committee or to those students in the talk, that's going to make you stand out because I've been to quite a few job talks where the person comes in and I'm only going to talk about physics or I'm only going to talk about math. And if you don't follow it, that's too bad. Mm. Well, at certain schools, that's not what they're looking for. Well, so even add on, on another level of that, there's the intermediary. So what are big departments, but you're only a part of a small subsection of it. So in psychology, you'll have developmental, you'll have clinical, you'll have cognitive, you'll have... Um, IO psychology, you'll have, et cetera, all these different sub areas. When you are a member of the department, you are, you know, the sub area of, you know, five or 10 people, but you are interviewing that entire psychology department, right? And in that context, you have to speak to all of these groups. And there's a, a second level of complexity, which is if they hire you for this sub area, that means developmental didn't get you or cognitive didn't get somebody, et cetera. They didn't get to hire somebody in their sub area. And right. so you've got to be able to impress not just your sub area that you'd be, your colleagues that you'd be working with, but this broader space of, well, there's 50 people here. I only work with 10 of them, but 
these other 40 have to be at least mildly interested in what I do. I can't blow them off. I can't just start and ignore cognitive psychology. No, yeah. right. they could be a potentially hostile audience to begin with because you took their line. Exactly, mm-hmm. exactly. And uh, to go back to what Chris was saying, in my last set of interviews, uh, I had members of industry that I interviewed with um, mm-hmm. and development officers. So, because part of what they were trying to uh, interview me for is, can I raise money for the school? Uh, I did not, I was fairly, you know, more probing than I was when I first came out of school asking, who am I going to meet with? What, you know, or can I get the agenda? Can I get the agenda? It was kind of uh, pestering them quite a bit right. ahead of time for all these, I want the agenda, I want to know who I'm going to meet with. Uh, for one of them I met, uh, one of my jobs, all I met with was uh, seven deans and the provost. I didn't meet with a single faculty member or any of this stuff. Um, so some of these things, you've got to get that agenda. You've got to know who these people are, especially the ones where you're going to have individual meetings. Mm-hmm. And even if you don't give a crap, ask about their research. <laughs> Read the damn abstracts, suck yes. it up, and pretend you care. Because one of my most easygoing colleagues ever got fairly pissed that a candidate who wasn't even there for a research job didn't ask about his research. Uh, people care. I mean, this is what they've invested their lives into. Right. Uh, yeah, talking about, and it's not just ego, this is their world. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's more, uh, it's almost narcissism to some yeah, degree. It, but it's an but, identity. I mean, there are identities yeah. around this profession and this this function. Yeah, so they just, you know, they want to know, then you give a crap. So let's, let's take a step back. I'm going to actually, because I, I failed at this in the front end for you, Chris, but I'll, I'll start at the, the the bigger thing, which is what is, the, what is the timeline, I think? You have to understand the different subsections of these things. And of course, this is all going to differ from everybody in a job search process, right? You don't know when the interviews are conducted. They may be at your academy meetings. They may be at a subdivision meeting. It may be something independent. Some do meetings at the, or interviews at the, uh, at, at the meeting. Some do all the interviews via Skype or via phone or via... Uh, in person or some combination of all of these things. So the key first thing to think about in any of this process is who is your first contact? And Robert set that up pretty well, right? So your first contact is whatever the call is and they mention a person who's head of the search committee. That's who a great person to reach out to. So you learn something about the place. Now they may set up a meeting. If it's going to be an informal meeting, if it's going to be meeting at an at a academy meeting, it's going to be something along those lines. Figure out what's the context, how long you've got, who you're going to be meeting with, and what's it going to cover? So if you've got 10 minutes in a room with 40 people who are interviewing 40 different people simultaneously and you're there with one other person and you're going to be moving from table to table while you you know go from this school to that school to that school, recognize you're not getting in-depth, they're not going to really focus on you that much, and you've got to be not offensive and at least slightly memorable. Because if you're offensive, they can just wipe you away because they probably are going to see 50 or 100 people in the course of three days. Yep. Right? So something that they put a positive check next to your name at the end of that time. It's usually uncomfortable in a lot of those spots. They're loud. They're not fun. But you can ask appropriate questions and and sort of the light version of the interview questions for them. You're going to want to know what's it like? Why are they there? What are they excited about with the place? Again, think of ego boosting kind of things. But it's also information gathering for you because you want to know about fit. You want to know if this is the kind of a place that you want to be a part of. And they want to know about you and are you going to be a good fit for them. Um... They have informal meetings. So what we've done at, at my university is we stopped doing formal meetings at the uh, the National Academy. Um, instead, what we do is informal meetings. We might just go try to find a couple of candidates that we like and say, hey, let's go grab a coffee. You know, just sit down and something like that. But that's not for everybody. That's not a prerequisite for the job. It's usually something of, hey, if you're around, we'd love to talk to you, but don't worry about it. It's not a big deal. You still got to treat that like a real interview. You can't take it as, oh, I can just, you know, let my guard down, curse up the storm and see what happens. <laughs> right. um, unless the, the job, you really want to fit that way. Yeah. Uh, you know, so, interview never ends. <laughs> exactly. I mean, you're going to walk around for five days. And in our case, our academy meetings are coming up there in August, usually in the hottest place uh, known to man because that's the cheapest place to go. Um, so I've walked around in a, in a full suit in Orlando, and that's really a fun time. Um, Orlando in August. <laughs> Orlando, any time of the year, I can debate whether or not it's good at all, but Orlando in August hey. in a suit, bad. 
<laughs> um, next step is they may look for phone calls and they may look for uh, Skype calls, something along those lines. Uh, be aware of what you're getting into. I think you had that situation, Robert, recently where you thought you were just going to do a, a Skype voice call and ended up being a Skype video call. Oh, yeah. You talk about oh. that briefly? <laughs> you mean when I uh, was barely dressed and hadn't shaved or taken a shower that day? <laughs> something to uh, that effect. <laughs> yeah, thankfully, it was a school I wasn't terribly interested in. <laughs> Because uh, that alone, I think, as uh, yeah, it came on and it was like, oh crap, video. <laughs> and I'm looking at them and they're in a conference room all in suits, uh, you know, a whole bunch of department heads and, 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 the, uh, and the provost. Um, and uh, yeah, it was pretty embarrassing. I was overly prepared from then on. That, that wasn't going to happen again. Where you wear a shirt that says, I was stupid, and he sort of points to the left or right. Back to the screen. <laughs> it points forward. Yeah, no. Uh, no. I was always wearing a t-shirt. I'm not going to live here with whether I was wearing pants. Um, I had actually considered whether it was worth actually getting out of my pajamas, because it was so early in the morning. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, but it was, yeah, that, that did not go well. <laughs> Transformer yeah. underoos, the wrong day to wear them. Yeah. Well, it's easy to get caught off guard, too. I mean, especially, um, I was cold, almost cold cold. I, you know, I had applied, I shouldn't say cold cold. I had applied to an institute. It was my first go around. And um, I didn't, I was an inexperienced graduate student and didn't know. I thought the school was a liberal arts college. Turned out it was a regional comprehensive. They called me and said, hey, I'm from such and such, you know, institution. Uh, would you like to talk? I'm like, I'm in my office. I'm like, Sure took me like because I'm dense with these things it took me like five minutes to realize this is a phone interview for a job <laughs> and then once that kind of settled in I made the comment yeah you know I'm really looking for uh, a place like you a small liberal arts college like uh we're a regional comprehensive of like you know 10,000 students <laughs> like yep I didn't get that job comparison to Arizona State yeah, you know? yeah right yeah, very small like 10,000 Right, right, right. So I was like, oh, well, there you go. So, yeah, you know, those phone interviews are easy to screw up. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Easy I think you get you lose you lose a lot of the cues. It's one of the big issues. I mean, all yeah. that research around media richness and so forth. If you're doing completely phone, you may relax. And again, I think people just have missed or stopped learning how to do phones correctly and phone calls. Because invariably, I've been on phone calls interviewing potential doctoral students or whatever, and I'm hearing the typing going on. You know, type, 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 type. And like, what's going on? Are you really paying attention to me? I'm talking to you, but I hear typing on you. Are you transcribing our interview? Are, I, I don't know what's happening here. I don't have yeah. your full attention, right? At least with a video, I can see that you're theoretically looking at me. Um, <laughs> you know, maybe the screen that you're looking at actually has, you know, the, the ball game scores on it and you're reading that, but at least you're attempting to make eye contact. And I call that a win. Um, <laughs> but I think that's one of the issues we've moved to is that people just aren't used to phone calls anymore. Uh, they're more used to either texting or something more rich like video. So we've missed that in between stage. So there be were aware of that. Interviews when people are on damn conference speaker phones. Mm -hmm. and, oh yeah. And I had to play the uh, yeah. You just were speaking for like two minutes to ask me a question. I have no idea what any of those words were. <laughs> you know, it, it didn't pick it up. The mic didn't pick it up right. or whatever. No, yeah, or they don't... cut out. You know, you get that cut in and out because they're like at the far end of the conference table right yeah so yeah. not only because those speaker phones you don't get people quiet it's either it, it will truncate the call and just call it noise and cut it out right so yeah that was very frustrating with a few of them right or people on their end having crap skype right oh yeah yeah, yeah so it's like yeah i know it's not my end <laughs> Well, you know, Stephen brought up a good point too. You don't don't type. Don't do, if you're on the phone and you're doing a phone interview, do nothing but talk on the phone. Right. If you want to take notes, fine. Do it after the call's over. Right. Right. Pay enough attention that you can remember. I mean, we are academics. We should have some kind of memory, <laughs> right? And then write it down after you're done. Because you're right. Because I mean, it could very well have been that doc student was. Uh, taking notes basically about the call. It could have been typing very relevant, or they could have been, you know, updating their Facebook status. Right. Who knows? Right. Or use a pencil. They're surprisingly quiet. Mm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Probably not on the screen. But even then, even <laughs> yeah. then, I would say don't, and, and uh, just wait until the call's over, you know, write yeah. the stuff down immediately and then 
just give them your undivided attention. I mean, so anyway, we got this. all those things. Even if you're worried about getting the names of the people, you can yeah. call the you can call the administrative assistant afterwards, and they yep. will tell you. Yep. yep. And it's a chance to suck up to the admin, mm -hmm. because almost every department asks the administrators, you know, the the, the secretaries, the administrative assistants, the work studies, the people that you run into, uh, you know, what were they like? What did you think? You know, and yeah, there were another faculty asked. They treated me like a surf. Mm -hmm. Not a good answer. Right. 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 So it's a chance to just treat them like a decent human being. And that, surprisingly, uh, you know, works very well. Yeah. Shake the hands of the staff, people. Yeah. I so, want to come back to that in a little bit, but let, let's keep yeah. moving forward because I think there's more to that point. Sorry, Chris. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say, I was going to move forward, actually, because we're going through this interview process. We talked about the phone interview. Let's say you've been successful at the the conference meet and greet, if there is one. You've, you've gone through it. They've invited you on campus now. I think that's basically the next step where we're at. Don't <laughs> underestimate the, the fact that they are attempting to hire for life. And so one of the things they're looking for is, and, as, and Robert's already pointed this out, are you going to be a good colleague? You could be the greatest business professor, physicist, you know, whatever in the world, but if you're not going to be a good colleague, right. you probably aren't going to get the job. Yeah. And that's something that I didn't appreciate either out of grad school. One of my second set of interviews, one of my second job, I had that down because I'd, I'd done interviews. Like I'd given, I'd been on the other side, right, hiring people. And just, you know, as Robert says, don't come off like an ass. Yeah. Well, and I think just as importantly as the other way around, do you want to be around these people for the rest of your life? Yes. Right. Yeah, you're, you're interviewing them just as much as they're interviewing you. Yeah, Stephen said the first part of the question, but I think there's a second half to it of, you know, why did you come here? Mm -hmm. I think for a lot of the faculty, you should also ask them, why did you stay? Yeah. Because it could have been, yeah, it was the best job on the market that year. Mm -hmm. You know, and, eh, it's good enough. You know, um, especially some of the, I think, associate level faculty, you know, if they came in and they got tenure and they stayed. Right. Uh, you know, why did you stay? So put them on the spot for once. It's a reasonable question. Yeah. But, I mean, I think it really gets at it. Do you want to be around these people for the rest of your life? Because some colleagues can make you just wish you were dead. You know, that's that's a big thing about, about my current department is that almost everybody there is are transplants. I think we have three people in the department that were there and this is their first job. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe we're up to five now because we just brought in some new people recently. But... Uh, the vast majority, this is their second or third job. So they chose to come here. So they saw what the grass was like um, elsewhere, right. and they came here, and now they've been here. So that you know, the average uh, time in, in residence for the department is 10, 15 years. Um, these are people who wanted to be at this location, and that's, that's a, an appealing piece. Um, and I think that it came from what Robert's talking about here, is if, if you find out these people like to be there, there's a lot of pluses uh, and then you, if you can, you might actually be able to reach people who have been at that place and why they left. And some of the times people left because, you know, I needed to be near my family or I needed to be, right. you know, at this other spot or whatever it might be. And some people left because I hated this location or I hated this experience. Those are things people will share with you. Um, you know, that yeah. it's... There's no reason not to. Yeah, and if they're tenured, honestly, most people don't seem to care. You know, I'll tell you, tell you the truth. I left this place because. And I'll say the same thing about my previous institution. I left the school almost entirely because it was located in the wrong state. You know, I had to move somewhere that was closer to my wife's family and that worked out very well for me. And you know, when I went to my boss and said, I, you know, my, my previous job saying, I want to let you know, I'm, I've taken a job elsewhere. He said, you know, what can I do to keep you here? And I said, can you move the university? If you can't do that, I can't, it, you can't solve my problem. And that's a reasonable thing. And I can, I've encouraged other people to go to the school. I've encouraged other people to be, to apply to the jobs and I've sent people to be doctoral students at the university because I have positive feelings about it. Um, so it's a reasonable thing to, to ask. Yeah, one thing that came up over and over, one of the real reasons that I picked this job, because uh, it certainly wasn't the money, um, was because they kept saying, uh, if you're here for more than two years, you'll stay for life. Uh, almost that theme just kept coming up over and over and over. And, and, and it was played out, I went and checked the composition of people and how long they've been around. Uh, but most of the people had either been there less than two years or over 20. Mm -hmm. um, because uh, also some hiring cycle weird little blips that you get. Um, but again, yeah, there are a couple of people left right away because they just went, oh my God, I'm in Las Cruces. And didn't want to be here. And other people were like, oh my God, I'm in Las Cruces. Right. Uh, 
So it's a, uh, and that was at this stage of my life, very important. I wanted to be around decent people that I didn't want to stab in the eye with a spoon. Stop, stop hitting. You're hitting. You're getting very angry at the table. Oh, yes. I'm doing to Steven. Sorry. This comes up. Yeah. <laughs> well, I want to just dovetail off this a little bit too, and it's actually important to a little earlier in the interview process, but I think it's important to point out here because you're talking about um, staying, right? Yeah. If you are applying and you're looking for your another tenure track job, all right, you want to be upfront. If you already have a tenure track job, you want to be upfront with why it is that you're leaving in your application, especially if you haven't gotten tenure yet in your current position. Because mm-hmm. one of the things the first people are going to ask is, so why are you leaving a tenure track position? And and I was asked that. What, tenure track, everyone will ask you at every place, why are you leaving your current job? Sure, yeah. but with, yeah, but I mean, there are issues with tenure track positions where you just basically, people ask, well, you, you've got the, you know, the the right. goal of academics, yeah. right? Right. Why, why are you leaving that? And I was asked that, you know, straight out several times when I was doing my second, um, round of job searching, if you will, you know, why are you leaving your, your job? And so I, you know, put that out there early and be honest with people, uh, because, you know, people know other people and it will come out if, uh, for whatever reason you might be leaving. So yeah, just be straight up honest. Um, and with that, and that was at least my experience, uh, when I was looking for the current job that I have now. Mm-hmm. So, so, and also I wanted to point out too, just to go back to the original topic, um, ask about the area because as Robert was pointing out, you know, um, some people will like the area, some people won't like the area. I, when I was interviewing for the current position, I said to a couple people, if you had a magic wand that you could change one thing about the place in which you live, what would it be? Mm. Oh, that's clever. And that will get you a sense of, you know, what do people like about the area? What do they dislike? Because you don't want to ask the question, what do you hate about this area? Right. That's a loaded question. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. But if you had the opportunity to make a change, what would you do? See, the, the, the part that I think it's important to, to, again, reiterate is, which is what Robert's talking about and, and what you're talking about, Chris, is both sides want a place that fits. Right. right? Because, right. you know, if we're hiring somebody and they're a tenure track job, this is a commitment for a long time. Right. And again, they, they might get tenure, they might not get tenure, whatever. But even for somebody who was in a, in a fixed term position, uh, an adjunct or even just a, uh, a clinical type of position, a place that there's not a guaranteed long term spot, but it's, it's a while. We still want somebody to be there and be happy and want to stay. There's a cost to doing hiring. You know, oh, yeah. we have to spend time, and time is the biggest killer for any any professor. If I have to give up time to do a search, interview people on the phone, interview people in person, um, maybe get the first round set of people that I, I want, but maybe have to go and reopen the hiring and try again, and if I have to do that every year, that's that's a killer. I mean, yeah. there are people that we have chosen said they seem like a pretty good fit, they seem like they you know would be productive, they would fit in with our culture, but we're not 100% sure that they really want to be here for more than three to five years. You know, and that's, we, we've decided not to make offers to them. And, and that's a terrible thought that says we, they meet every criteria, but they haven't really expressed their commitment to this location. If that's the case, we, we don't necessarily want to do it because we don't want to go back and interview in two years. We don't want to do it again. We want you to be here and be the right person. Um, I think that's probably the biggest difference between us and any other field. Yeah. Where we yes. go, yeah, five years, yeah, it's not long enough. We don't want you. Right. Yeah. Where most people leave jobs and move every two to three years. Right. So because like, if you're in academia, five years? all right. Yeah, if, yeah, unless you're in a major city, you've got one school in the town. You yeah. know, if you don't like this university, you're going to a different town and very possibly a different state. You yes. know, it, it's not an easy just you know go across the street kind of a spot. And it's why the interviews are three days, yeah. two days, three days, right? That was the one thing that also caught me somewhat by surprise um, in graduate school. It's like. I figured, you know, if it was for a job, you a day, you go out, you come back, whatever. No, 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 no. <laughs> you know, three days, multiple talks in some cases. They're feeling you out. You're feeling them out. And uh, it's a it's a different kind of beast than getting looking for a job in industry. Mm-hmm. And the cost of time. But also, if you're a scientist, you might get startup money. Mm-hmm. And so a school does not want to... Um, you know, have someone who's only going to stick around for a couple of years if they've already given them fifty, hundred plus thousand dollars to start up a lab. Yep. Oh, it could be even worse. I remember uh, when I first got to Penn State, 
and uh, they were talking about the difficulty in setting up these new labs. Mm -hmm. And labs now, it's like, well, salary's not the problem. We'll pay them whatever yeah. they want. We don't care. It's the million dollars to set up the lab. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, it's, yeah, it's become winner take all. And the physical yeah. space for it. I mean, there are no physical yes. space. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Well, I uh, believe we have come close to our half hour mark. I actually did not take a start time when we uh, <laughs> did this. Uh, let's give uh, one last piece of advice to those who are looking for uh, a position. Uh, Robert, what would you, one last piece of advice? Got to find a way to protect your ego because you are going to get your share of uh, what I refer to as the PFO. Um, I've actually, I, <laughs> I got one the other day. I mean, I'm, I'm at the new job. Uh, from a thing I forgot I applied to almost a year ago. And still, it pissed me off. Yeah. So, uh, you gotta just kind of take it in stride. You're going to get your share. No matter what kind of superstar you are, someone's going to decide they don't want you. Don't take it personal. You never know why. Uh, right. There are jobs, let's be honest, there are jobs that are posted that you will interview for that you had no chance of getting because they had yep. already picked who they were going to get. Mm -hmm. yep. And they had to bring in some other candidates to make it look like it was honest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That happens. You know, people get cherry picked, but you still have to go through process, and it really sucks for the candidate who's the fill in. Um, yeah, so you don't know. You never know. It's, it's, it's political, it's personal. Sometimes it has nothing to do with your quality as a colleague or a researcher, or an academic, or a teacher. So, uh, yeah, you just kind of just roll with the punches. It's not going to be the first time someone's going to slam the door in your face. Right. I'll, I'll build off of that as my advice. Uh, everything you say or do has consequence not just in that interview, but for other interviews as well. Um, we are a small academy of people, small group of people. Everybody likes to gossip. And if I heard, you know, if you do something stupid, like you realize, as, as Robert's saying, oh man, I got no chance of this job. They've already, we're going to hire somebody else. And you act like a jerk in that interview. The likelihood is, you know, I know the person you know, in your department, and that person's going to call me up and be like, hey, I just got this story about this guy that interviewed here, Chris, you know, and I can't believe what happened. You're like, Chris, Chris, oh, I think we're interviewing Chris. Oh, interesting. And yeah. I've, I have stories. I have Pretty stories awesome. of myself doing it, I, or not myself, but in the sense of I was at a university and knew the story of somebody did this at a different university. Uh, I have stories of people who specifically just canceled the interview saying, you know what, I heard they did it other place, we, we're not even going to interview them now. Um, you're always on. And then there's the other side, which may be the good stuff. Even if you're not the fit for this year, we're looking to hire this person, but we brought some other people in, you might still be eligible. If you do a good enough job, they may find a way to get you a job, either this year or next year. Uh, and mm -hmm. I've benefited from that, where I didn't get the job because that wasn't the person they were looking for that year, but the next year they contacted me and said, hey, you know, by the way, we, we, we still want you. Can we, can we hire you? You're still available. Um, so don't don't punt on any interview. Be good from top to bottom, beginning to end. Everybody knows everybody. Everybody knows yep. everybody. Yep. And also building off of that, I guess my advice would be be honest with yourself and with those you're interviewing with. Because if you are not honest, people will find out. And, and don't take you, the job just to take a job. Do not take the job just to take a job. Uh, well, I mean, that's an easy piece of advice to give when you already have a job. Yeah. Yeah, but, I, you know, okay, let's really assume is. that people are actually, like most academics, going to move around a bit. Mm -hmm. A lot of them do have jobs while they're looking for jobs. Yeah. So, I mean, so, don't jump just to jump. Yeah, yeah. Just but, but, but be honest with yourself, be honest with the interviewers, and uh, and know what you're getting yourself into before you go to the interview. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, Agreed. all right. Well, with that, I'm sure we will have another episode again in the future on interviews because this is a rich topic and I think there's there's still more to be said. Yeah. So with that, we will uh, conclude the show and uh, everybody, uh, get back to writing. <laughs>